I caught up with musician Eric Avery in the backyard of his West Los Angeles home, where we discussed his current project soon to have a limited release on Alessandro Cortini's cassette label. We also discussed his artistic process behind his 2013 independent release, Lifetime, starting with The Great American Portable Neighborhood. That is the best example of what I was trying to do on that record that I didn't really wind up doing in the end, which was, you know, as, as often happens, it's, you know, the creative idea that gets you in the chair doesn't wind up being the creative idea that you finish with. My, what my thinking was, was I wanted to create a record that was a landscape of sounds where sort of parts of songs would, would erupt out of it for a moment, sort of like there's a surrealist. surrealist who does these sort of empty spaces and then there's like a little blob, a little surrealist blob here and there. And that's sort of how I was picturing I was gonna make the entire record, like not have it be a proper, here's your intro, then your first verse, then your you know break, and then your second verse, and then your pre-chorus, and your chorus, you know, that kind of thing. And so that song, The Great American Portable Neighborhood, was probably the most perfect realization of that idea. I just wanted it to be a song fragment and then an atmosphere or a landscape yeah and so that is the that song is the only way i think i really successfully did my original conceptual idea um, and so that's why it's sort of structured that way just sort of a little snippet of a song dissolving into um, a, an atmosphere also on the album is a tribute to 20th century French composer, Messian. I named it Messian because I had been reading about something that Messian used, like particular modes, he called them modes of limited transposition. And so, sort of instead of a key, I started using some of his rules to just see if I could write something that, you know, sounded musical or surprising somehow to me and, and hopefully to a listener. That's what I really love about his stuff, especially there's this amazing piano piece, 20 views of the baby Jesus or something. I went to see it live in Santa Monica. Um, and it's like an epic piano piece. And especially the very beginning are these incredibly great dark chords that are just really sort of musical, but the, but it's not like you can go, oh, it's a C and then an E and then a, a G, you know. Um, and so it's this amazing piece. We are the hollow men. We are the stuffed men. Leaning together, headpiece filled with straw, alas. Set against, and sometimes with, T.S. Eliot's poem, The Hollow Men, the track Fade explores the nature of the human condition. talk about the preparations for a storm that never came. It really is just the idea. It was born from actually in the in the backyard here, going through the hassle of taking all the, the covers off the stuff and putting them in the garage and you know any anything that like because the storm's coming and it's gonna make everything wet and and then it never did and, and I and I just it struck me as one of those things like the idea that oftentimes we are all tempted to prepare for the worst that never comes and that one can get stuck doing that, you know, where you sort of start being concerned about one thing and then you have to try to keep life from happening and that, that way and then, you know, so then you wind up having to get all these things, bulwarks against all these things that might come and, and hurt you um, and then you become entrapped by that. It's just an amazing and more direct sort of poem from him um, that you don't need to be an academic to get. You know, and then it's a direct lift 
from for the this end. This is the way. This is the way the world, the world ends. This is the way the world ends. Not this with a bang. The world ends not with a bang, but a whimper. But a whimper. Just directly from Elliot. Start any time. There are a couple of themes that have been lyrically littered throughout everything I, I've ever written lyrically, um, which is like sort of the biggest themes. Like, what is your life about? What are, what are the ticking moments of your life? How are you defining them? How are you, you know, therefore, by extension, how are you defining your life? Because it's happening right now and you know, and in a way it's sort of my own constant conversation with my fears or concerns or thanatoid drive toward not having a life, whatever the, the impulse. I try not to do proper sampling of someone else's music, but I think that there is still a sensibility that I have that has just always been with me which is, I like tapestries of things. I like, I like there to be multiple textures and stuff. When I listen to, to my work, I notice it often as a texture. That is one of the few instances where I had a very specific thing, front to back idea, that I was just talking directly about which was the idea of our belief systems. Dense with layers both sonic and cerebral is the track The Only Secret Is There Is No Secret At All. I had been, I think it was, I had read Sam Harris who had made ob the observation that whenever somebody doesn't understand how I could be an atheist, one of the ways I can help them to understand is to just point out the way that you feel about other gods that aren't yours, just imagine feeling that way about one more God. Then you understand how I feel. I just see it all as being a story that you tell yourself and it's fine and if you get something from it, great. That they are somehow more right than all of the numbers of gods that haven't made it, that didn't make the cut, you know. And so anyway, so I made it just a long list and littered in that list of dead gods are some of the living gods, you know. And so I was just speaking specifically to that. Here, Eric discusses his current project, part one of which is a 21-minute opus, a journey through genre, tone, and expectation. He offers some insights on how this track came to be. I'm just putting together pieces, and I, at least the thinking is now, what I'm doing is, I'm doing tops and tails of songs so that they can go continuously from one piece into the next. Um, um, because I, I, uh, I, I purposefully was doing things, either trying to do things with a bass tone that could be put with another song, you know, like, so if I'm if I have a drone going I've built on a C, then, you know, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep in mind that I want my drones to be, other drones to be on a, you know, uh, on an E or so, you know, some other, you know, fifth or something of that, so that I have the ability to have, um, you know, overlap and, and for there to be continuous music. So each side will be whatever length it winds up being, continuous music. 
once you are sort of removed from the idea that you you need to make a direct living from each of your records and, and certainly my last solo record the help wanted record was that the last time I felt sort of like I'm making songs with some idea that, that maybe these songs will be my living and um, I think that as a group of artists we started to um, you know they say that that like an I think Marshall McLuhan maybe said that a new technology doesn't doesn't erase the old one, it just defines what was great about the old one. And so, and I, I've seen that definitely happen, you know, now some iterations with the CDs and the digital and, the, and all that. And so I think what happened was is that we sort of went, okay, we have this digital thing, we have the short attention span world filled with stuff for us. Not lots of novelty and stuff. And so I think that some of us started to go, well, wh what about the people that really put on old headphones and listen to cassette tapes and to vinyl tracks and things like that? And, and then if there are those people, then let's really make the listening experience something really rich and deep and, you know, committed. And so you have artists like William Sinsky and people going like, okay, well then let's have processes that happen over 45 minutes and give that to somebody to listen to. And so, you know, I think that at least for me, I certainly know that I don't always have the patience to sit through the entire disintegration loops or whatever. And, but it doesn't mean that I don't, don't sometimes have that, you know? And so I think that there is a depth and of quality listening that that exists that we are sort of appreciating and supporting when we do these more challenging things and by virtue of the fact that you're there as a listener willing to hear stay for 10 minutes of a wall of noise or whatever to hear textural differences and things like you know that you can then it's like a self-perpetuating um, system. It's like, okay, they're there to hear this. That means I can do that. And that's more enveloping and, you know, like a 30 second hit of this would be pointless because it'll just be noise and, the, and there's no time for anything interesting now. You know, so, and if you were looking for that, there's plenty of that and you'll enjoy those other things. But here we're doing this and, you know, and so you have the, you know, the sort of, I guess, boutique, but, but people that want to experience, like to smoke pot and lay on the floor and put the headphones on and not move after, you know, for 40 minutes and, right. and really go on a journey. I would say that the, the basic kind of principle that informs everything for me is learning. And that is what keeps me interested as a, as a 49 year old guy. A lot of my listening is out of curiosity. Like there's something I've read about, something like I'm just curious to hear what that person's doing. Um, I go to certain blogs, like I go to Alex Ross's blog and I'll see if there's something going on in the classical um, instrument world that I haven't heard about or whatever. And I go to listen to that. Uh, and I often listen as a student Like the, the modular experience is like action painting, kind of. You know, there's something about it that's really, you don't know where you're going, you're not certain. You often take one voltage and, you know, I mean, this may, may not be true for Alessandro as much, but for me, certainly, you take a voltage and you're like, now is that even an in or an out? I'm not sure. Plug it in, nothing happens. Okay, plug it into the next hole. Whoa, this weird thing happened. It's surprising. And you go, oh, wow, okay, cool. Um, and uh, so I think that there's always that that's appealing to us old guys who just, you know, like it's either that or I'm, you know, playing jazzy or bass, you know, like those are my kind of choices as I get older, you know, and I, I don't want to play more notes as a bass player. And, 
Definitely what I like about them is the fact that they are, and I think that this is true even of, you know, guys like Alessandro or Trent or people that really, really know what they're doing, unlike me. Um, I think that there is just an element of surprise and discovery that is really exciting about them. It's also what makes them frustrated as well, you know, sometimes you're just like, you know, like, oh wow, I've spent my whole afternoon and what I've done is just make something that sounds like, you know, like new age meditation music and who wants more of that, you know. Um, but like, an example happened when I was out at Josh's the other day, which is where I was just, I was doing something and I did exactly that. Like I spent all afternoon in my newbie kind of way, you know, um, plugging stuff in, getting something, it all sounded professional in air quotes. Um, and I started recording it and I was just like listening back to what was happening and and I was thinking this is really just really boring and stupid and, and the world already has this music so why it doesn't need more of it. And so I just I just started to turn the the original clock that I had built everything off of re really high and just started going, okay, now, well, now it just sounds like a, an idiot who's, who's doing it really fast now, doing new age music really fast. And then I just like went, Bleh, and spun the, the clock entirely off. And then just all these things started happening that were fantastic because all these, these, filters were opening super slowly and and the relationships between them all and how they were all a little bit off from each other all started being kind of revealed in this in this I called it taffy actually so that I would remember which one it was because it sort of reminded me of taffy if it, it affects my approach on other things but one way that it definitely affects it is it just makes me much more aware of what it takes to build a sound what do I need to do to that to make it sound like something alive okay if I apply this other thing then it's going woo, 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 you know and then and you're just sort of building and creating it 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 is an education by doing for the creation of all, any sound. So therefore, when you then go play piano, I notice like, oh, the reason why I don't like playing this up here is because there's this really bad, you know, sort of frequency that's happening as you go from that note to that. And then you look at the thing, you know, and like you just hear things a little bit more um, technically in a way that's helpful for problem solving. You know, like, as a bass player, like, I know that my, like, going and doing work for garbage last week, um, you know, I know that I now have the vernacular to talk <coughs> about um, something that's going on with the sound, technically, in a way that I didn't before, just because of the fact that I'm now used to digging around in the, in the sort of, um, under the hood of music, um, which is what you have to do in order to make modular stuff sound like something anyone wants to hear. You know. My generation has definitely been corrupted by the computer. Like, I think that the generation after us are getting super creative with them and stuff, you know, obviously. Um, and this is a broad generalization, of course. But me and my peers have definitely gone from having to be so well practiced with a song before you go into the recording studio that you really have that decision made this is the part I want to play, and this is what it's going to sound like. And then playing it, you know, um, to being like, that's good enough. 
and, and then walking away from it, knowing that you can just sort of fix it, or, you know. And the danger with that is, especially when you work alone, like I do a lot on these sorts of things, what you wind up doing is creating piles of stuff that, that you listen to and you just don't feel any inspiration from. That being said, I'm also not one of those guys now who's like, oh my God, tape. The revival of tape will save us all and our souls will be renewed. I just think there are lots of amazing tools that it's silly to limit oneself. And listening to playback of other things where I had done sort of a hybrid of stuff, where I'd done captures of things, and then but also had used things like Max MSP, which is an amazing um, tool, and, and just other gadgets. And I just sat there going, I'm hamstringing myself. Like, it's really silly to limit oneself. Like, ultimately, I'll be dumping this all onto tape. But the idea that I would only use what was already on tape and not, not use anything else was just, like, I thought, I'm, it's just like using my fist to, to hammer a nail instead of using a nail gun. It's just silly, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so, so now this is um, listening back to what I'm putting together. I've dumped it all into a computer so I can do the just the basic sequencing and things like that and then lay it back out on the tape. But it'll be like certainly I don't know which ones are or, or which. You know, sometimes I'm like, is that is that something I did over at Josh's? I can't remember. It sounds like it. Or is that my own modular here? Or is it my A6 and my virus doing something or you know, like like I really don't know now. Mm -hmm. often and I think that's a good thing you know so I'm not married to any one thing at the you know and therefore limited to only it I was just talking about this with Annabelle last night because I was saying how one of the things that's great about Alessandro being sort of a mentor for, for me yeah. is that he's always saying just shut the fuck up finish a thing, put it aside, move on and make a new thing, right. which is the exact opposite of what I tend to do. Oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, you know, I, oh, it's this to that, you know, I have a little pinch of this, a pinch of that needs. I think that's the, the more practical answer for just getting something fucking done, um, which has certainly been my struggle my whole life is the, is the last 10% of the song, you know, it's the first 90 I have no problem with. But I do think that there is caution. It, it is worth taking caution when a gadget is really specific. I try to just go about my musical day and know that things that pique my interest are sometimes from a uh, time ago. And I'm always informed by the sort of framework or parameters of whatever the technology is that we're working with at that time. Lately, I've, I've definitely been doing a lot of work with reverbs and stuff like that. And I feel like this is the era of the reverb. You know, like a lot of what I listen to and a lot of what's being made is bathed in, in reverb. And I feel like that's a thing that I sort of know a few years from now, we'll look back and go, oh, it was the time when everybody was doing the just everything is tons of verb, you know. And, you know, because I've been doing freezes and, and, and uh, that sort of, or infinite um, input uh, into reverbs and stuff a lot lately. But I also know that it'll all sort of work itself out. I mean, and then that's, don't even get me started talking about classical music and, and that sort of dated because I've been trying to write a symphony about L.A. and trying to write it for a chamber orchestra that I am a fan of and, and on the board of uh, Wild Up. But how to not sound European. It just sounds like European in the you know 19th century or something instead of like Los Angeles in the 20th or 21st century. You know? So when I went back and listened to what I had been recording in the, in the, since the fall of last year for ostensibly for a record for Alessandro's new label, 
I listened to it and liked it, and I thought, see now, when I was listening to it in the fall, I had my engineer cap on, and so therefore all I could hear was, oh, it's because it's too much high end, or the low end isn't defined enough, or the bit, and, that, and all that sort of, which is fine for an engineer, but if you're trying to be an artist first, that's just death. You know, like I just, I, I would wind up just disappointed with every fucking piece of music I was writing. But yeah, I mean, and that's, and that is the spirit of what Alessandro wanted for this record and what the sort of spirit of the label is going to be based on he, the relationship between uh, Alessandro and his partner, Ted Butler. They are, there's a podcast that already exists called Norelco Mori, and it's sort of a very boutique He's a collector of analog tapes, and all the recordings, even though sometimes they're disparate styles, they all have that, that certain quality. It sounds like you can hear the sort of the tape hiss kind of thing, or it sounds like, certainly it sounds to me like, when I, when I grabbed a hold of a four track, of, you know, an old uh, Tascam cassette based four track, it took me back to the very beginnings of music for me, like the, certainly the beginnings of music recording, which was me and a machine exactly like that in, you know, when I was maybe 16 or something, maybe. The idea of committing to tape is a very different approach than when we're using Ableton or Logic or something, you know. You know, we were talking about it last night because I asked him, I said, so on the cassettes per side, what, what is the time? And I think he said, it's got to be more than five minutes per side and less than 45 or something, something like that. I, for, I forget exactly what the parameters were. But what I think I'm going to do for the download part is because what Norel Komori is doing is they're doing... Um, they're gonna do like very limited audio cassettes runs of like a hundred cassettes and then Bandcamp downloads or some some digital download you know so what I what I'm gonna do for my record is I'm piecing together for the cassette continuous music um, and then I think probably for the download part I'll have them be separate files that you can download and, and, you know, so you sort of have both ability to put on the cassette, put on the headphones, smoke pot, do that thing, or go to the band camp and go, oh, I really like that one piece, but the rest of it's really boring. I'm just going to download that one thing. there are these two young fish swimming along and they happen to meet an older fish swimming the other way who nods at them and says, morning boys, how's the water? And the two young fish swim on for a bit and then eventually one of them looks over at the other and goes, what the hell is water? The Tibetans, they make those sand mandalas incredibly ornate things from from sand, like different colored sand. Mm -hmm. And then they make these, you know, like sometimes whatever, you know, maybe five or 10 foot diameter things on the ground that are incredibly intricate and it takes forever. And then once they're done, they just destroy it, you know, and collect it together. And 